All right, everybody, welcome to the jump seat. Today we are in episode number 13. We are uh, going to be talking about some interesting stuff today. For those who haven't joined the jump seat before, it's a weekly spotlight bringing uh, you key industry thought leaders, subject matter experts, and next gen insights affecting you and your department. Hosted by two jump seat firefighters, myself, John, and Dave. Hey, John. How's it going today? Great, man. It's great to be back in the jump seat with you. And uh, Were you uh, on a beach somewhere last week or something you like know, that? You know, I could have got used to doing that from the from the beach every week. Uh, I tell you what, it was kind of hard to come back home and uh, get back into the the groove of things in the home office because the, uh, the sitting on a beach and fishing every day, it's hard to beat. Hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Well, uh, glad you could join us again here. I wanted to uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening in the fire service, Dave. Yeah, well, I tell you what, there's a, there's a couple of things. Uh, first off, before we go to the fire service, I am excited. And I, I know uh, I am a sports nut, right? And so, hey, we got baseball back. We are back to the good old pastime and baseball starting. Uh, so for any of you who are watching, who happens to be Cleveland Indian fans like me, hey, 7 o'clock tonight, actually I think 7.05 official first pitch. Uh, the Indians are back. Uh, yep. Bring on the World Series, man. There you Frankie go. Lindor said it today, this morning, we're going to the World Series. So um, <laughs> I can't wait. Anyway, I'm glad that we're, we've got some baseball back. That'll be exciting. Uh, I can't wait for that. But, you know, along those same exciting news is in the fire service, you ask, hey, what's ha happening? You know, um, I'm going to jump clear back. I think it was episode three uh, of the jump seat. We, um, we actually, it all was happening kind of right at the same time uh, that we were doing the, the initial stage of the jump seat. But, there was a huge explosion back on March 16th, uh, injuring uh, 12 L.A. City firefighters. Um, so this is actually big news because the, the last of the 12 uh, firefighters, uh, um, actually I think it was 65 days in the hospital, came out on Tuesday. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, it was an amazing video to watch. Uh, hopefully, you know, all of us in the fire service can, can take something away from that and learn. Um, but, um, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm just glad to hear that, um, they're, uh, they're all home. Some yep. are back on, on the job mm -hmm. and, uh, I hope, uh, hope the best for their continued recovery. That, that's my, yeah. my, my big thing here. Well, and I said it that day and I, I'll say it again, just the, to me, it was a proof of testament of the quality of our gear and our PPE and what, I mean, it's just amazing what that actually saved, uh, us from and, and just the. The intensity of that fire. If you haven't seen the video, go check it out. Type in LA City uh, explosion. It'll be right there. There's a whole bunch of different videos of it. But yeah, our gear, uh, thanks to our gear manufacturers for keeping those guys safe. So, Well, you know, and, and actually, I would even throw that back to the LA City Fire Department, some of the training they've done. Obviously, for the, that crew uh, inside to identify quickly that things just weren't right and to, to start the bailout process before the explosion happened. Yeah. Um, it could have been so much worse. So, um, yeah. you bet. I, I'm glad they're all, they're all home and doing mm -hmm. well. And I wish them continued, uh, success in their recovery. So most definitely, but, um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, we could drag on here today in the jump seat, but I don't think we should. I, I, I think we've got exciting guests today. What do you think, <laughs> John? Let's do it. Who we got, Dave? <laughs> Hey, you know what? Um, uh, it's actually my pleasure to bring on uh, another member of the IDEX fire and safety team. And so we, you know, we've not done a lot of this. We've actually typically been jumping out and uh, getting experts from the outside or, um, you know, reaching out to uh, um, customers and getting plant tours and things of that nature, which have been really fun. But we've got a, a great opportunity here today. And uh, with us is, uh, is, is Tim Schott. And, and so, uh, Tim, you know, he has been a, uh, a fire department guy from the get go, uh, really joining the first responder community at a young age, right out of high school. He joined the, uh, Indiana air national guard, um, and, uh, you know, became a, a firefighter and, uh, EMT. Uh, I think he actually got a certification from Indiana state university. Um, I know it's not the Ohio state university, but I won't hold it against you being a little bit to the West there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Tim has, uh, has, has had the opportunity to uh, serve as a district chief at Sullivan Fire Department, uh, where he held that, uh, that position for many years and then, you know, moved on uh, to where he is today with uh, Thunderbird Fire Protection Territory. 
Uh, and uh, you currently serve, I think, as a captain, Tim, with over 30 years of experience in the fire service. You know, yes. and, and I, I don't want to take anything away from Tim because he's actually got an incredible fire background, but, you know, his expertise is, is rescue. And uh, um, when you look at uh, uh, IDEX fire and safety, you know, a piece of us is fire, the other half is our safety, and it really comes into a big piece of that is our rescue our specialists, our rescue guys. And so Tim is really uh, one of the leading experts when it comes to pneumatics and in that space. And currently he serves as a uh, Midwest regional sales rep for Hearst Jaws of Life, where he actually takes a lot of time educating and training first responders every single day. Tim's number one priority every day is making sure that he's arming all of our first responders, including John and myself, right, with that proper knowledge and proficiency uh, to, to be successful when it comes uh, uh, to that rescue. And so, you know, uh, it's a great opportunity to have you on, Tim. Welcome to the jump seat. And uh, I think John and I have got some uh, great stuff to share with you uh, or, or throw at you, but I know you've got some, some great media and, and comments back for us. So welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I uh, look forward to having a good discussion. And like you said, you know, one of the big things that we do out there is we educate, but at the same time, we also learn while we're out there too, because, you know, out, out amongst all of the guys out across the, country and the world, sometimes we're learning new techniques that help us build new products and change the way rescue is done. Uh, it's just, it's an awesome opportunity. And it's the best part of the job by far. That's awesome, Tim. Yeah, thanks for you coming know, in. And I just I've, yeah, I appreciate getting to know you and brush past with you on some of our uh, our visits and departments that we go see. And I'm excited to hear from you a little bit. Um, so on the top. Hey, of, hey, hey John. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. John, real, real quick, before we even jump into the, you know, into the, the topic specifically, I mean, you know, I think pneumatics is one of those things that's overlooked, Tim, in many ways. And uh, I'm just, John, when's the last time you guys pulled your airbags out or used uh, any of those pneumatics at your department? Too long. Too long. Too long, yeah. yeah. I, I was actually just thinking about it as we were talking, and, and I'm like, you know what? I, I can't tell you when we did it before, but we actually just did it last training, last month at my department, which is very unusual. But uh, I, think it's, I think it's a great subject and a great topic that we've got and, and really pertinent because I think it's often overlooked in a really critical and an, uh, an effective tool. Yeah, we hear that all over the country. You know, it is the one, you know, the one item that we carry that we just don't get to use it that often. We, we don't see that many entrapments that are truly, you know, pinned in by a heavy object that we're looking to, you know, be able to move to free the entrapment. Most of the stuff, you know, the, the sexy stuff that's out there are jaws of life, spreaders, cutters, and ripping and tearing metal. But that day when the emergency arrives and it's a, a lifting time, there's so many components that go into play with that. And we don't train on it enough. And that's, that's what we see all across. If you don't have a tech rescue team that's doing that, you know, seven days a week that train on it all the time, you're not, number one, you're not really adequate in what's going on. You forget how the pieces go together and the moving parts that go along with it. And it can be one of your most technical rescues. So, uh, you know, the education side of it has been exciting because there is more and more, you know, knowledge being shared. The, the education that you get as a basic firefighter through one and two, you know, is so much better, especially when you get into, you know, the uh, vehicle machinery tech classes and op classes now, there's a little more focus on it. And that's a great thing because a lot of times we didn't get that. You know, once a year we pull them out, look at them, and, you know, then we forget about them. So, yeah. Kind of for, for the viewers out there, yeah, give absolutely. us kind of a paint, paint an illustration from a high level, kind of on the history of pneumatics. Just catch us up to speed a little bit, maybe where they where they were, where they are, and maybe where they're going. Yeah, cool. Um, you know, it, it's funny. It's really easy to remember because, um, you know, the Jaws of Life, you know, were invented and started in the early 70s, 70, 71 in that area. And that really lifting, you know, bags themselves got started then as well uh, by Manfred Vetter um, over in Germany. And he started out by building, you know, low pressure cushions, you know, which ran at like 7.25 PSI. So, wasn't a real high pressure system or anything. It's more what we saw 
with uh, wrecker recovering devices to upright trailers and stuff when they had rolled over, uh, that type of thing, and aircraft lifting in the aircraft industry. But uh, within the first few years of that being released, you know, they came out with what they called the mini lifting bag series, which was only like just under 90 PSI, somewhere around 85 to 87 PSI is all that were put in. And that's what we know now as what was the conventional bag. And I'll refer to conventional bags. And that's the, what we're most aware of is, you know, the flat bag that's in a square rectangular form. That is basically some rubber with some reinforcing fiber of some type that's been vulcanized together. Um, and, and that's when it all really got started um, and where it kind of blew from there. But we didn't see a lot of improvements, you know, some pressure changes, um, that kind of thing. We went from steel belting in those, which made the bag very thick and a little harder to get inserted in a tight place uh, because the steel belting just didn't collapse nice and flat. And then, of course, we went into the Kevlar style fibers instead of steel belting, which was a big improvement to start with. It took a ton of weight off the rigs and off the guys trying to position them at the same time, but also made them a lot flatter and able to withstand a little more pressure as well to where we are today. I mean, all our systems in today's world for better run at 174 PSI, which... You know, we'll talk a little bit later about how that affects your capacity and the size of the bag needed to do so. But um, some of the biggest advancements, you know, happened, you know, throughout the industry, not just with Better, but throughout the industry back in the 90s when the uh, first high pressure, if you will, round bags, you know, were designed. And then, you know, uh, everybody has kind of jumped on board with that because the, the values of it were definitely evident once they started getting them out there in the field and how they worked to make it more stable um, and, and some in lifting capacities and stuff and being able to even connect bags together now instead of just stacking them untethered. So a ton of stuff has gone on in, you know, in the last you know, 10, 15 years, a lot of changes have really happened out there making the job a little easier, a little more effective. You know, when you look at that, you, you, you think about, hey, there hasn't been a whole lot of, of uh, technology change since the infancy, clear, in the, clear back in the 70s. But there's been a number of things here, I think, in, in the last several years, let's say five, six years, um, that really have helped do some of that advancement into the, the airbag technology. What, what were some of those advancements and, and how do you see that kind of shaping the future of pneumatics and uh, in the airbags? Yeah, I mean, you know, in around 2015, you know, Vetter came out with their connectable bags um, that didn't require a lot of effort. You could start out with just a single bag. And, and when we talk about this, we talk about, you know, taking a bag that is round with a flat top and a flat bottom, where before we were always taking the, you know, conventional flat square bag and inflating it. And basically, if you're a basketball fan, you know, turning it into a basketball and which became more and more unstable the higher the lift got and also lost all your capacity so you start out maybe with a 40 ton bag and you end up maybe lifting 400 500 pounds at full height uh, it just depends on your you know being able to actually you know touch what you wanted to lift and we'll talk a little more about that but now that the bags are connectable we got away from only being able to stack two bags because in a conventional system, you know, you can only stack two bags because they just they're so uncontrollable once they turn into a basketball, basically, that the risk is too high to, to even tr attempt it. And now we can stack by locking together up to three bags, you know, in a system and get the additional height that we need. And, you know, not just the height, but if, if you think about it, our rigs carry a ton of equipment. And one of the things that we never have enough of on that really bad day seems to be the stabilization cribbing. Uh, there's just not enough room with the dual purpose and the you know tri purposes that we use our rigs for now. Um, so we would run out and to build a platform up on something that was three or four feet in the air to be able to put a bag on to start a good lift. You know, being able to bridge the gap by connecting three bags together 
you know, we saved a lot of cribbing that we could use for stabilization and capturing the load um, for our safety and the victims as well. So it was a big advancement that, you know, people don't even think about. And along with that, you know, an airbag doesn't just lift, it can also push. So now that these bags can be locked together, we can use them to move objects horizontally. You know, if we get a, a vehicle pinned up against a bridge embankment or a jersey barrier, something along those lines, typically we would work from the opposite side of the vehicle and work our way through basically tunneling to get that victim out. Now, if need be, we can controllably move the vehicle away from the object with some airbags and still be using, you know, the remainder of our rescue cash to be working on plan A or plan B to get that, you know, victim untangled. So the applications have really exponentially increased being able to horizontally use these, right? Versus just yeah. like you said, a lift was very practical at times, but it was limited to a lift. And now you're saying we can take that same technology and really expand how we use our tools safely and effectively. Absolutely. Well, and I think, I think it's a great thing because my traditional mindset has always been, hey, we use airbags to lift. They're just made to lift, not to force, not to push, not to maneuver things to be more effective with other tools in the, in the toolbox either. So it's a great, it's a great thing to expand our thinking of how to utilize this more effectively. So, you know, I, I think obviously with these advancements, with these changes, uh, you know, we, we did a little pre-work here earlier in the week trying to get ready for the show. And one of the things, Tim, you kind of brought to my attention and John's is there's a new standard out from NFPA on airbags, right? And that, that kind of changes the game a little bit here. Uh, and uh, may, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, what is the new NFPA standard for airbags and uh, what's the associated criteria with that? Sure. Um, you know, for years we had pushed that there be some sort of a standard uh, just just to be able to hold all manufacturers accountable, but not, not even to that point, just to give, how many times have you been to your department and you pulled your airbags out and you look at them and, you know, they're 20 years old and you don't know if they're going to operate or not. Every time you use them in training, they operate, but you don't know that they're going to operate under full load because we just don't use them enough. So we pushed for a standard to come out that says, hey, rubber degregates, you know, and especially when it's two sheets of neoprene rubber put together, you get that moisture and condensation that just happens inside the bag. And, and therefore, you can't inspect the inside of those conventional pillow bags. There's no way to look inside there to see how bad the dry rot in the corners and along the edges really is. So, you know, Vetter has always hydro tested their bags. And that was one of the things that we felt was important. We always recommended that you hydro test your bags every five years. And, you know, for a long time, Vetter, you know, would say the maximum lifespan of one of our bags is 18 years. We felt like 15 was a, a better resource because we saw bags fail. You know, once you started getting to 15 to 18 years, you can see bags fail during this testing. And, you know, the new standard, basically, there, there's two different ones that affect it. 30, 1936 affects, you know, what the bag is, how it's going to be labeled, how it is designed, that type of thing. So that's great because it, it basically says, yes, this bag did conform to a standard as it was developed. And here's how you can really certify that. Now, the 37, the 1937 standard on the care and maintenance is really where things came in and made some great changes, in my opinion. It now requires that every month the fire department personnel are going to inspect their system and make sure it's serviceable. So once a month, and it has to be documented like anything else that NFPA does. So once a month, the guys are going to pull this off the rig. They're going to make sure it's serviceable, that the regulator has an O-ring in it. The stupid stuff that we show up and we put it together and we find out that, hey, we're missing a bullnose O-ring on the regulator and now we can't use the system. Nobody has one handy. You know, those things to make sure that it is operational every month. And that's also going to make the guys more familiar 
with the yep. use of it and how it all connects together because there's so, let's face it there's so many different air connections out there from female male type connections that it it truly can be cumbersome if you're running a different style air chisel with a different fitting on it and, and that type of thing but then it also goes further and says yearly you will have a certified technician that will come in and inspect the system and perform a, a, a pure operational test as well that's been trained by the manufacturer. That's huge because yeah. that means they're going to come in and they're going to basically certify that at that point in time, the bag was functional to what it was designed to do. And if he sees any, you know, abnormalities or anything, you know, he's going to check at that point with his own set of gauges if there's any uh, loss in pressure over time on the controller so that you're not losing, you know, lift capacity or pressure in the system while you're using it. Those little things that will stop big issues in the future. And then it also says basically that you're going to adhere to the manufacturer's standard on how to test the bag itself. And for better every five years you are going to have that bag hydrostatically tested and the the great thing that was you know took place in, in i believe it's 30 1936 it also said at the 15th year the bag is no longer serviceable so you have to pull it out now to me i've had so many chiefs say look i have to show a standard to my committee or my town board or my city fathers that says I have to replace these because they ask if they still work and they do, but there's nothing that says it can be, you know, that it's not a service after a certain shelf life. Now we have that documentation for them and they can have better equipment that they can ensure it's going to work when they need it. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I thought of too within that too, is just the, the operational familiarization the, the frequency that will touch this stuff, doing just what you described, will enable us to respond more consistently when we need these, get it right the first time, low light, no light, right? We should know how these feel because we've used them so many more times than if we just dug them out and, oh, uh, here's how they go together. Okay, great. No, now it'll be a lot more, you know, just that muscle memory and the tensile, you know, with the, the dexterity, we'll know the feel of when it's set up right and when it's not. Exactly. Well, that's great. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, Tim, as you think about this, we got this new standard in place. Um, hey, we're encouraging people to utilize them more. Um, I mean, you've been doing pneumatics for, you know, how many years now? Uh, well, I, I guess since day one, you know, we all had, you know, bags when we started on the fire department. It, like you said, though, you know, you just don't get the opportunity. You don't train on them enough. But in the field, in the rescue industry, it's been 20 years now that I've been involved with emergency pneumatics and teaching and, you know, uh, educating others and helping design where the future is going to go and what we would like to see. Because it's so hard for, for sometimes a company to make a change when the industry doesn't talk about what they would like to see improvements. And that's been an exciting part of this because, you know, who everybody knows the conventional flat bag. When you introduce something new that's round with a flat top and bottom, it's funny because you still see people that say, yeah, I just like the old ones better. You like the old ones better basically because that's what you learned on, that's what you understood. And the minute someone shows you them side by side, and, and the fact that, you know, conventional bags aren't a bad thing by any means. There are a lot of uses for conventional bags, the flat bag, that the connectable bags will not accomplish. But if you could now have a hybrid system and be able to run these all together off the same hoses, the same controllers, you can have a couple of conventional flat bags for when you get into hand entrapments and machinery, stuff like that, where you want the bag to conform around it or a starter bag, however you want to look at it, you know, the best of both worlds is have a little bit of both to be able to make your job more effective and faster and a lot safer for both the rescuer and the victim. 
So taking your years of experience, 20 plus in teaching and educating pneumatics, what are some of the you know biggest mistakes people make when using them and, and you know how can they avoid that? How can they how can they stay on uh, ahead of it to, to get into those precarious situations? You know, there there are a couple of facets that actually you know come about. Number one, uh, a lot of people don't understand how a pneumatic lift bag actually works. They they just don't understand that the air pressure times the surface contact of the bag gives you how many pounds you can actually lift. Now, to understand that, you know, we'll, we'll see a video later and we'll talk a little more about it, but just because it says 40 tons doesn't mean it's going to lift 2,000 pounds for you if you can't touch enough surface contact. Um, but I'll tell you, the biggest issue that I see is with, cribbing and stabilization. You know, for years, we all, you know, I don't want to say flew by the seat of our pants, but we did what we had to do, and we we did it with uh, less uh, emphasis on safety. And, you know, the more I've lifted, you know, weird objects, standard objects, you know, everyday cars, the more I realize that cribbing and stabilization is the most important thing out there. If you can get something to lift and you drop it, you didn't do any good. So we want to capture our load. We don't do enough cribbing and stabilization. And most people, they you know, they think about a lift bag. All they want to do is throw some cribbing in to capture the load so that it doesn't come back down if the bag comes out or something shifts. But you think about it, when we're, we're starting to move, let's say we're lifting up the rear end of a 52-foot semi-trailer and the wind blows and it starts to shift it in one direction, you know, the cribbing won't stop it from shifting unless you take the pressure out of the bags and set it back down. So that's that's really built the, uh, the strut, uh, the stabilization, jacks, whatever you want to call them, uh, everything that's out there for a tension buttress system because you have to capture the horizontal movement, not just the vertical movement of the load coming back down, but you've got to stop the horizontal movement as well. And that has, you know, really gotten better in the last 10 years. But prior to that, we really flew by the seat of our pants when we were out there lifting stuff. Huh, that's great information, Tim. Um, the neat part is, too, that the, our discussion is now available for all of our users to learn. And if they aren't, aren't, aren't aware of the standards, you know, we'll have to – link the, them to the 1936 standards as well. So I'm excited for that. And um, tell me when you want me to fire up that video, but we did have some visuals too for those watching to, to check out. Yeah, go ahead and kick it off and we'll right. kind of walk our way through it. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Tim, I've got it playing here. All right, so the first thing you're going to see here is we'll, we're just talking a little bit about, you know, the square bag. And if you want to hold it right here, you, you see how the conventional bag, when you inflate it, it is like a basketball. And it, it does have a lot less surface contact. As you can see here where my hand is, realistically, if we're lifting something, the only surface contact that you have is what's in the palm of my hand. And remember... If you take a simple mathematic equation and you figure length times width times the pressure that you can put in the bag, that will give you how many pounds you can lift at that point in time. You know, the, you know, like I said earlier, you take a 20-ton airbag. It lifts 20 tons, and it's rated to lift it only one inch. The bag may say on the, on the tag on it that, that that bag will lift 12 inches of height. It will lift 12 inches in height but it will only lift the rated capacity at one inch because the corners start pulling away all of your surface contact. So the higher you go, the less you lift. That's one of the number one misconceptions in lifting bags is you have to know what you can lift at the height you're looking for. And that's critical. Now, can you imagine, you saw how wobbly that was. Can you imagine both those bags being inflated at the same time and wobbling around? That's why cribbing and stabilization is so important. And on the other side of that, 
as the as probably the one of the most you know important things when it comes to our safety is there's always a kick out zone when you're using a lifting device and it's usually opposite of your pivot point so don't ever set your controller up or your command out in front of the airbag opposite of where it's pivoting because if something does go wrong let's say we have a sloughing load and it sloshes to one side and the, the center of gravity shifts and the bags come out you know you could be in that kick out zone and that's not where you want to be bad things happen set up for the worst and you know you'll come out ahead every time but yeah that's great information let's see should we let her play here or jump up a ways yeah you can kick it right back up to the next one we're going to talk okay. about what the connectable bags look like so okay. here basically is a connectable bag it has a hard plate you know it's round it has a hard plate on both top and bottom and then we use a little plate off to the side of the screen there that is a connection plate. It's kind of like a Stortz fitting. It has a couple of bayonets on it. And you simply, if you're going to connect two bags, you simply put that plate on, put it in place, and lock it in place, which is a reference mark that shows you how to do it. And you see it's very simple. Are those it, a machined aluminum, Tim? I'm just curious on what that's made of, those interlocking it's an, plates. It's, a, it's an alloy. Okay. Yep. So, and you'll, you'll notice that I'll spin it a little bit. There's actually a mark that shows you where it's locked and you're just locking it in like a Stortz connector. I mean, it's really simple. Wow. And the, you know, the, the bottom of the other bag is exactly the same as the top as you saw on this one. They're identical. And there's a reference point and you simply set the bag on top, line up the reference point. It slops down into the bayonets or the Stortz fitting and you spin it. The nipples line up and it locks together. So now they're both attached with a solid piece between them. So that is really a cool part. You can stop it right here if you want. You know, we talked a few minutes ago about how you figure the capacities and that one inch was the maximum lift you were going to get out of the actual, you know, conventional bag on what its rating is. And there is no minimum lifting capacity to a conventional bag. The conventional bag basically, you know, because it really depends on what's above it at that point in time. But the great thing about these, you know, connectable bags is with that hard point that's there that's flattened in contact with the bag, the pressure always sees that point and the pressure can push up against it, transferring the lifting capacity into that plate. So there is a minimum lifting capacity when you start working with that, which is awesome because a lot of times they'll call it the end lifting capacities. So you'll know at full height, you can lift a certain amount, no matter what. So like the system we have here, there are three sizes. This is the smaller one, which is the 30 ton and it's a metric, 30 metric ton. There's also a medium and a large that go up from 75 metric to 172 metric tons in the system. But the small ones that you see in front of you, which probably are the most popular because of their size and their capacity, you're still able to lift seven tons, no matter what, at full height. So you know, instead of it being 700 pounds, you can lift seven tons, hmm. which is huge. Wow. wow. Big difference. And what is that height? In, in this specific bag, what is that height, Tim? Oh, I want to say that one is 11 and a half inches. Yeah, so. And being able to stack three of them so you could see how you could do away with your platform, save your cribbing for stabilization, and notice that when they inflate, you know, they're very solid, rigid, but again, they have a large flat area, so you don't get that rounded out top that wants to roll around with you, hmm. even when the second bag inflates. And the cool thing about it is as your bag lifts, it's going to follow the load. We always lift with the top bag first uh, if we can with this system because it allows the top bag to follow the load and the bottom bag can pivot and seize the ground below it because it doesn't have four corners. Wow. Very giving huh that's fantastic and and this is just a, a quick shot of you know two conventional bags of the same size 
being stacked and uh, doing a quick lift just to talk about the height. You know, and, and I'm one of those guys that when I'm running the operation, I mean, we go to 174 pounds now. Every pound of air that you put in your system, you know, creates a reaction force, in my opinion. So the least amount of air that I need to be able to do the job with the most surface contact makes it a lot safer for everybody. So you'll notice we came up with the bottom bag made contact, and then we started to inflate the top bag a little bit to make sure it was placed properly. And then we just worked them back and forth. Now we're going to get into a, a two-point lift because you can use these bags singly. If we had a patient in between the center of gravity and we needed one on each side. And it's very simple, very stable, and you can stop it right there real quick. What a lot of people don't think of is at that shot right there, if I'm using my square conventional bags, I'm probably running about 40 pounds in each bag, depending on the true height and the size of the bag. But with this system, because it'll lift seven tons, no matter what, I'm running about 12 pounds of air right there in each bag. So the wow. reaction force is so low that it's very forgiving. You don't get a bag that wants to kick out as bad because it doesn't have that extra pressure in it. It's kind of like, you know, grabbing a hold of that spring and pulling it back as far as you can or a recurve bow. You know, when you let go, it's going to have the force coming off of it. So the least amount that we put in there, the better off we are for our safety. Mm -hmm. Wow. Then you kick it back in. We're going to go to a, a single point double bag stack now. And you're going to see them connect the bags together here. Uh, simple operation. The things that are important now is, you know, you've all heard the term lift an inch, crib an inch. Um, yep. That term was a great term when it came out, but I believe in using wedges, so you should never have gap between your cribbing. The one thing that this enables us to do with the bags now is that you saw how quick they go up. It, it's going to go up really fast now and we're still controlling it, but we go, the cribbers can actually get overwhelmed. Know what you can lift at the height. Yeah, you can actually get overwhelmed as a cribber because you can't keep up. And you're gonna see now, we left the cribbing loose in this next section with the bags partially inflated just to show the stability without making total contact with cribbing. Notice the bags aren't wobbling around. You know, it, it's it's amazing how forgiving this bag is if it's in a bad position. But again, we probably only had about uh, 20 pounds in the top bag, or maybe 12 pounds in the top bag, and three or four in that bottom bag at that point in time. But notice how fast you get the full height out of that thing. It, it's crazy. You know, here we are at basically 22 inches off the ground and we could achieve that in less than 30 seconds if our cribbers are doing their job and able to keep up hmm. and very stable. Wow. With less pressure, like you said, than well, previous yeah. generations of this stuff. So, well, and you can manipulate that as well. Imagine <laughs> if um, we were out in a marshy ground and we started our lift. You know, the bottom bag, we might only put a pound or two in and leave it at only an inch or two of lift so that it has that wide footprint in the soft surface contact and then put the rest of the lift power to the bag above it so it has a wider platform at the bottom, kind of like throwing down a four by four sheet of plywood or a steel outrigger plate. Yeah, just, just it's pure physics, just distributing the weight, right? Absolutely. And it's the same way on the other side of that. Say you've got a, a panel van um, or maybe a tank truck over on its side that has a really soft sidewall. You do the same thing with the top bag. Raise it just a little bit so that it bellows out and conforms to the load. And then lift with the lower bag so that you're not putting all the force in one small area like you do with a conventional style bag. Well, Tim, I, I think uh, this has been great stuff that you've been sharing with us here. And I think uh, we got one more. Sorry. Whoops. Sorry. 
Now this is a this is an edge lift. A lot of people don't realize that you can actually lift with the edge of these bags to a point to get the load lifted. And this is no cribbing, no stabilization, just working off the edges of the bag. And that's the back of a you know truck that weighs ten thousand pounds. And yet. You know, we're able to start in the worst type of edge lift possible, whether it's a graduated edge. Imagine that tire being a big concrete culvert pipe in a trench, and it's backfilled some, and it's got a worker's leg trapped. You'll see here, just as it starts to go up again, I'll shift the tire one way or the other with the bag. I could actually let the air out of one bag now and increase it in the other and move that pipe if it was a pipe or shift it one direction or another away from the victim. You can see how I'm changing the direction. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy stuff. Of course, we should always be cribbing, always to capture what we gained, because our goal in this quick lift would have been to get under a frame member somewhere where we had a, a, a better contact point by far. You know, I, I think these are great little tricks and tips, and, and you know, it kind of goes back to, you know, this is an incredible tool. And I mean, just that last image of you being able to shift that tire forward or backwards, we're thinking about it in a pipe, uh, as you mentioned, in a trench. Um, you know, that's one of those things that we forget about. We don't train on at all. So I think, that, you know, uh, I'm glad you're able to join us in the jump seat today, Tim, and really get, get our, our minds thinking differently about pneumatics and really the value that tool can truly bring uh, to the rescuers from the toolbox. And I think it's, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind too many times. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a great thing. Uh, the industry is always changing and there's a lot of really cool products that are out there now. A lot of times we just sometimes don't look for them because it's one of the ones we don't use the most and it can definitely make your job and the people you take care of out in your jurisdiction, it can make a big difference you know, when they need you for sure. Yeah. Really appreciate you having me on it. It's been a great deal. Thanks for only running at 15 minutes today. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we always have a tendency to go a little long, particularly when we've got <laughs> good, interesting content and, and, and uh, videos and videos as well. Yeah. To support Thanks it, for so. that for us, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. You sure. guys be safe. Thank all you right, very much. Man. And for we'll all of you who are actually, uh, Everybody who's listening and says, hey, how do I learn more about it? By the way, right at the bottom there, uh, we've got it up there. You can get a hold of Tim directly. Uh, Tshot at idexcorp.com uh, is his email. But you can check out more at uh, you know jawsoflife.com or uh, betterrescue.com. There's a lot of information, a lot of value resources, and there's a, a number of rescue specialists just like Tim, not only around the country but around the world. Uh, for our other uh, sister brands as well to uh, to help educate and support um, all of your uh, uh, rescue and safety needs. Tim, yeah, thank Tim. you very much for joining us in the jump seat. And Tim, the only thing is you got to come back sometime. All right. That's the only, that's the only thing. <laughs> Any, anytime guys. All right. Take care. Yeah, Tim. Right. Thanks Tim. Well, Dave, that was uh, another valuable, valuable piece of info there for sure. And, and, uh, we went a little long today, but I think it was well worth it. So I'll, I'll wrap things up and just let everybody know uh, that we will be back next week as well. It'll be the 31st. Uh, next Friday, we'll be doing episode 15. Um, for those that uh, that want to add uh, comments, please do. And let us know who you'd like to see on the jump seat someday. And we'll uh, see if we can get them in. Um, but uh, everybody have a safe rest of their Friday and weekend. Uh, for those on duty, be safe. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Take care.